time he saw a large woman whose mind never made it onto the bus with her... Can I start over? <laughs> you never knew when people's insides would come out. One time he saw a large woman whose mind never made it onto the bus with her get shot in the face by a boy who had at first seemed kind-eyed. People screamed. Blood splashed on the windows. They made everyone stay on the bus with the splash blood windows and the large, mindless woman with guts for a face. Police took the shooter boy with the gun away, and he saw then that the boy's eyes had been holding something boys lose. That other boy looked right at him, and he felt dead momentarily. He was only saved by his glasses, likely. For this reason, upon arriving at his stop, he pushed his glasses up tighter to his eyes and felt the security of the thick black plastic above his ears. He stood and made his way to the front of the bus, passing various people lumps along the way, though he dare not make eye contact with any of them or who knows what might happen. It had before. He thought he wouldn't be able to ride the bus at all after that, but then he'd have to walk, and walking had its own problems, among them distance. <laughs> His knees and shins already hurt from walking every day. The bus, no matter what world it presented, was still his best option. When you're a boy, you have to choose. And cities were violent. That was just true. You can't help what you're born into. The walk out of the bus always felt like a test. The floor of the bus smelled like worn rubber and too many feet. He kept his hands jammed into his pockets so far he could feel the seams and a hole beginning and bits of lint. He pushed his fingers against the flesh of his thighs. His forefinger broke through the hole. He could feel his skin barely there like boy hairs. He made his way toward the front of the bus. His backpack felt heavier than it should. He wondered if he looked exactly like a cartoon human turtle. He stared straight down and did that thing where he made himself go deaf until danger had passed. Up front, the bus smelled like people's underarms and pee and tires. Briefly, he felt he might barf, but then the hiss and clank of the bus door opening and the rush of cold air revived him. And if the bus driver said anything to him upon his descent and exit, he didn't hear it. He was just being a boy. He didn't look at the driver. That guy looked like he could snap at any moment. Bus drivers went nuts sometimes. It was on TV. You saw it. And he was hairy. <laughs> the boy's cheeks heated and flushed the instant the cold air hit him. It made his teeth ache. His eyes dried up like dumb, lost ice cubes. The tips of his ears pinched. He wished he had a hat. Boys were supposed to be sent out to school with hats peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and a kiss, and a word like mother. He trudged along, watching the tops of his shoes come and go. Why was one shoe scuffed up front and the other one not? What the hell was that, he wondered. What was true about him that he would mean that one shoe was worn on the top and the other was not? It worried him, it worried him. Was there something weird about the way he walked? Did he do something with his feet all day at school that he didn't realize? Where one shoe was scuffed up and the other one wasn't? Did anyone see? Did he kick things but then not remember? He wondered how long he'd have to live through boy to get to something better. Sometimes he worried he wouldn't make it to the other side. Sometimes he worried there wasn't another side, just some trick of height and weight and the sag of a man gut and the way men grew pouches where their cheeks used to be. And their noses and ears, from the looks of things, he suspected men's noses never stopped growing. Or he'd heard that at school or on TV, he couldn't remember. He always pictured a man with a nose like a moose's, unable to stand upright any longer, tipping over, his arms flailing. <laughs> then, of course, they had heart attacks, likely. His walk home changed daily. The actual route was the same, which helped him, but events and scenery were never the same, which confused him. A right could look like a left if someone ran a red light and hit the side of an old Buick hard enough to lodge it up into the curb. Crowds could form out of nowhere, cops, dogs, pigeons even. Composition was everything. Small details changing could have epic effects. 
Once, a man came running out of the mini-mart with armfuls of beer bottles, and two bottles slipped from the man's arms and shattered and splashed there on the sidewalk, and the owner came rushing out next with an actual rifle, yelling and yelling in some language the boy didn't know, or a language he did know that sounded different when yelled, <laughs> until the thief got down on the ground and started begging or something. No, wait, it looked vaguely like praying, or what he imagined praying was from TV. <laughs> Beer he knew about. Rifles and praying were from TV and movies. The thief went down on the ground with the rifle and yelling in his cheek against the cement. Beer everywhere. The boy saw the thief lick the cement and cry. That whole day, the world seemed tilted. He almost missed his apartment building turn off. All the apartment buildings suddenly looked like upset, crooked adult faces. <laughs> the mini mark came and went. Today, the Mini Mart just looked like a Mini Mart. A dog barked around the corner. Bum pee wafted up every alleyway or so. He stared at cracks in the sidewalk. From the position of the stop signs and fire hydrants, he was about halfway home. If he counted his steps, it would go faster. Five, six, seven, 18, 19, 20, 21. That thing with his shoe. If he hadn't been looking down and concentrating on the geography of the ground, he likely would have missed it, the thing, or stepped in it. But he was a boy who paid attention to the ground of things, so he saw it there against the hard, lame gray of the sidewalk, splayed across a particularly fancy crack that fissured out in all directions. Was something wrong? Something red and purple and pink and veined and wet and globby looking with a glistening gray worm or a wormish thing trailing away from it. He tilted his head from side to side, trying to decide what was the top and what was the bottom of the globby thing. It looked like butcher's meat. It looked like an alien head. It looked like what guts might look like if they were on the outside. The boy looked around. A siren warbled. A Chinese woman two blocks up pulling a grocery stroller. Guys on a corner too far away to tell their ages. Street signs and garbage and two crows. He looked at the thing. He ventured his scuffed foot toward the shoe, toward the mass, the shoe and the mass in his vision. It didn't move. He foot nudged it. It jiggled some, but then oozed back into splatted whatever. He looked around. A taxi drove by going the other direction. A woman opened her window and threw the contents of a dustpan out into the air. He squat down next to his fine. Now he was below regular people's sight. He could feel the shift in things immediately. He was eye level with tires now, with newspaper stands, close to gutters and drains and bird poop and cats and curbside reality. From this angle, the thing looked not only bigger, but even more wrong. Not like someone barfed up their lunch, not anything like a run-over cat, which he'd considered briefly when he'd been standing up. The veins all through it were blue-gray and white and lined outward like little rivers. It smelled like butchers, it smelled like dead jellyfish washed up, it smelled like car exhausts and donuts. He was less than a block from his favorite donut shop, his stomach ground. His knees and thighs ate from squatting. He wished he had a stick. Boys needed sticks in the world, didn't they? But his backpack was just filled with book bricks. Then he thought of the part of his glasses that covered his ears. He took his glasses off and stared at them. The black plastic was sturdy and thick. In truth, his glasses felt vaguely magical to him. He'd survived the gunfire day, hadn't he? He angled them in his hand so that the part that goes over your ears was pointed at the claw? Then he poked it deeply. When he pulled his glasses back, a thread of gooey ooze kept them connected for a moment. Umbilical. It smelled like fish. It smelled like blood. It smelled like the idea of the word mother. That's when he heard the air say his name. Mikael, the urban air around him whispered. Then louder, snapping his head to the right and locking his eyes on the edge of a brick alleyway corner. Between the glob 
and the voice was his name. Mikael, come here. If he followed the ick of the glistening worm-like thing coming out of the red goop, it kind of pointed around the corner like a map for a boy, just for a boy. It wasn't air after all. It was a woman's voice, and she was singing. <laughs>